Celebrating 44 years on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, the president says he wants to cut emissions by half in the next nine years. We'll discuss. In Southern Gardening, we're staying in the shade again, but there's some sun peeking through. In the markets, oh, the irony, row crops bullish, but cattle left behind. Zach Ashmore digs in. And in our feature, this farm is tiny, but its output huge. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. No matter how you may feel about climate change, it has become an issue influencing politics around the globe. As the weather impacts farmers, climate took center stage last week. Joe Biden, who campaigned on climate change, invited world leaders to join him in a summit where he made a bold declaration. Farm Week's Jonah Holland is in the studio with more. Jonah. Mike, there's no question that the president raised eyebrows with his climate pledge, one that would require broad support at home and around the world. Hoping to secure the latter, he invited 40 leaders from Brazil, China, the Russian Federation, and beyond to discuss his vision for the future of the world's climate. You know, those that do take action and make bold investments in their people and clean energy future will win the good jobs of tomorrow and make their economies more resilient and more competitive. So let's run that race, win more, win more sustainable future than we have now. The president opened his leader summit on climate with a pledge that the U.S. would reduce its carbon emissions 50% by 2030. That ambitious goal would require a dramatic change in how Americans receive and use energy. Many scientists believe the reduction is necessary to help slow the planet's warming caused by a carbon dioxide concentration of over 400 parts per million. Climate scientists say the Earth hasn't seen CO2 levels over 300 parts per million in 800,000 years. They also believed the added carbon has caused global temperatures to rise 2 degrees since the 1880s. To protect the environment is to protect productivity, and to improve the environment is to boost productivity. The truth is as simple as that. China also pledged to reduce its coal consumption over the next 20 years. The country struggles with major air pollution from the burning of coal and from vehicle emissions. The Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack also unveiled what he called climate smart policies, including one, a commitment of $300 million for 85 public-private partnerships to cut carbon emissions. And two, a large increase in the number of conservation reserve acres from 20 million to 25 million. Along with more incentives for farmers to participate in CRP, the larger number of acres will sequester 15 million tons of CO2. As of 2019, pre-pandemic, the U.S. had already reduced its carbon emissions 13 percent, about half of the Obama administration's goal of a 25 percent reduction. Regarding those public-private partnerships, the NRCS says they'll be designed to help farmers and ranchers and even forest landowners, implement systems that conserve water and soil, improve the health of animal habitats, and ultimately increase climate resilience. Whether the Biden administration will get the support it needs remains to be seen. Mike. Thanks, Jonah. Back on that 50% reduction, the president has yet to offer details on how he hopes to do that by the end of the decade. One thing we know for sure is that it will be a very expensive undertaking. Beyond that, all eyes will remain on China, the world's number one air polluter. In the Newswire, producers in North Carolina who employ H-2A farm workers have a chance under the CARES Act to be reimbursed for losses they suffered during the pandemic. About 1,000 farmers in that state hire H-2A workers. $2 million is available and about 20,000 immigrants are working there. The money will be available until the funds run out. The Biden administration announced it will expand the use of pandemic EBT under the American Rescue Plan in what it calls, quote, 
a game-changing intervention to reduce child hunger in the U.S. The program was established in March of 2020, this year. It's expanded to feed kids of all ages during the summer and beyond. The program was set to expire by the end of September. It will continue indefinitely. And finally, in testimony before the House Ag Committee a few days ago, it was clear that having every rural home in the nation connected to the internet remains a priority. One expert also said connecting the crops themselves to the web will dramatically increase farmers' bottom lines. But without broadband, farmers can't take advantage of it. Experts say it would cost a minimum of $150 billion to connect every farm and field in America. On the lighter side, we're still in the shade, at least halfway, with Southern Gardening. If you're in the mood for a beautiful but easy care sun or shade plant for that landscape, Gary Bachman has an idea for you, some interesting varieties of the ever-popular begonia. Here's Gary. One of my favorite groups of flowering annuals for the summer season are begonias. Let's take a look at some great choices for the sun and shade. The first begonia is the 2019 Mississippi Medallion winner, Whopper Red with Bronze Leaf Improved, that produces big red blooms along with shimmery bronze leaves. This plant has dazzling three inch diameter flowers from spring to fall. Plus, this plant can grow and thrive in the full Mississippi sun. Tolerance to hot and humid Mississippi garden conditions is a reason Dragonwing begonia was chosen as a Mississippi medallion winner in 2002. This continues to be a winner with its attractive and lush wing-shaped foliage. The flowers are produced practically non-stop in scarlet red clusters that will dangle from the bushy mounds. This is a vigorous growing plant in full shade, but prefers partial shade that will add to its summer performance. A great choice for a beautiful container plant has to be the easy to grow torch red angel wing begonia. This selection is ever blooming and produces brilliant red flower clusters at almost every node along the canes. The green leaves are pointed and the undersides are deep red. In the full shade, the flower color is a lighter shade of red. The most robust color is produced when grown in the morning sun with afternoon shade. Be sure to grow your begonias in well-drained potting mix because they don't like wet feet. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up in our Farm Week feature, imagine a farm that's only 400 square feet uses only eight gallons of water a day, grows a variety of crops without the sun, with a crop cycle from seed to harvest in eight weeks. Can you actually make a living this way? Yes, you can. And we'll meet an urban farmer harvesting his way into the hearts of his customers. That's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. At Mississippi State University, Extension is reaching beyond the college campus and impacting adult education. We're instructing agricultural professionals on the latest trends in research and technology, inspiring communities, empowering small businesses, and promoting the growth of healthy families where youth and adults can reach their fullest potential. The MSU Extension Service, sharing our vision for the future. ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Never carry more than one person on a single rider four-wheeler. The four-wheeler can become unstable and very dangerous. ATVs are designed for off-road use only. Never drive one on a highway or any other paved surface. And always ride the right size machine at the right speed. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. It's a simple idea. Knowledge that transforms lives shouldn't be limited to those on a campus, but extended to any and all who want or need it, wherever they are. At Mississippi State University, we've been making that possible for more than 100 years through the MSU Extension Service. What began as an effort to extend the latest research to farmers has become something much more. 
Today, we're helping Mississippians from all walks of life, giving them the tools they need to build a brighter future. We're sparking the imagination of students around the state and inspiring the next generation of doctors. We're helping rural communities find their way to the internet and connect to the world at large. And we're teaching families how to lead healthier lives in ways both big and small. MSU is standing firm in its commitment to that one simple idea. Extend the knowledge that transforms lives wherever they are. Time once again for the markets with Zach Ashmore. He says that row crops are bullish, but cattle is left behind, and he's here to sort it all out. Zach? Thanks, Mike. And you're completely right. We're seeing a small repeat of last week, though. Row crops up, but this time only live cattle down. We'll get into why in a moment, but when I say row crops up, I mean really, really up. It's a bullish market out there for corn, beans, and wheat. Let's take a look. Last week's only loss, live cattle at about three and a half cents. As I said, we'll look into that in a bit. The short version, as grain prices rise, livestock prices adapt. Last week's biggest gain, soybeans up 93 and a half cents, but wheat and corn were no slouch of about 57 and 47 cents respectively. So what's the reason for all these huge gains? Market analyst Mark Gold says it relates to carryouts, that is, leftover supply from the previous market year, along with weather effects here in the U.S. A freeze hitting wheat country last week, compounding with tight supplies from harvest last year, and there you have it, a bullish market. Here's Mark to explain more. We haven't seen these prices since 2013, 2014. The American farmers got to be feeling pretty good out here. Um, obviously, we're trying to ration and make sure we've got enough carryouts in the long run out here. As we've been saying, as about everybody's been saying, this year the carryouts are so tight, we can't afford to have any hiccups in production. And we start the year now with this cold snap that we've had, delayed planting, the wheat being affected to some extent by the frost. So it's not a getting off to a great start. Now we can recover from this, but it's adding the anxiety into the market, which is adding the euphoria from the farmers. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag. We had, in, particularly in Texas and Oklahoma, about 10% of the wheat had it. So where they got the hard frost, there's gonna be an impact there. Now how much, we're gonna have to wait and see. But certainly there was an impact there. And one of the reasons wheat rallied. Now is wheat gonna rally as much as it did without corn doing what it did? Probably not. But on the other hand, we're starting to see some countries and some operations switch from corn into more wheat feeding. China came up with an announcement saying they want to back off corn feeding and replace it with other feedstuffs. So I think that all added into the wheat market here. You've got the same two choices you've always had. You can sell the grain and buy some calls. And this is one year we've been saying from the very beginning, if you're selling $4 corn or $9 beans, you need to reown it with some call options. Now we're up here at 650 corn, 550 new crop. We're up here at over $13 new crop beans. If you want to make some sales, go ahead. But we've got a lot of summer in front of us. And if there was a, a, a serious drought and we reduce these yields even more, there's no telling where these prices could go. Moving on to cattle, as I said, price is falling, but not by much. We're not seeing anything too dramatic here. However, what was dramatic? This month's cattle on feed report. Here's what it said. Inventory up 5% from this time last year. Heifers and heifer calves up 7% and feedlot placements up 28% from March 2020. Yeah, that's 28% as in 2 million head compared to this time last year at 1.56 million head, which at that time was 23% below 2019. I spoke with Extension Livestock Economist Josh Maples to put it all together. So after this latest cattle on feed report, what effect, if any, is it having on the price of cattle? Yeah, that's a good question, Zach. And, you know, so the latest cattle on feed report, um, I think, was generally fairly positive on prices, especially compared to what it could have been. Uh, so, you know, we expected really large placement totals, uh, but the range on just how large was pretty wide. 
Uh, and so this, the placement total that came through in this report was on the low end of that range. P compared to pre-report expectations, I would say that uh, this report was generally positive on prices because we didn't see those huge uh, placement totals um, that, that we might have. Row crops have seen a big surge these past several weeks, and while cattle's kind of heading downward a little bit. So why, why is that? What's causing that? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And really, those two are completely related. If you think about uh, especially corn prices, that's a major input for cattle feed. Uh, so whenever the price of an input goes up like that, uh, that has a negative impact on the price of cattle. So cattle markets have been watching uh, the corn markets very closely uh, and this sharp increase in, in grain prices uh, over the last six months or so uh, has, has been a headwind to cattle prices. Well, going back to the cattle on feed report real quick, uh, were there any uh, statistics or facts in that report that seem surprising to you or is this all just normal for this time of year? Yeah, I would say there's nothing normal about this one because of what we're comparing it to. Uh, you know, this was the March 2021, uh, looking at placements during March of 2021. Uh, if you think back to those year ago levels, you know, we're up, placements are up 28% uh, over a year ago. That's a huge number year over year increase. And it's all because of what was going on in March of 2020 when we had really low placement numbers. Uh, so these reports as they come out over these next few months are gonna look far from normal and they're going to require a whole lot of context whenever you're interpreting them because we're going to be referring back to the really disruptive months from a year ago. So what you're saying in essence this is sort of a correction after what happened last year because what happened last year was so dramatic now we're actually getting back to normal even though things do look extreme. Is that too is that fair unfair? What do you think? That, no that's that's a pretty good way to put it you know it's just going to require some context you know in normal times if we were to say a 28 percent increase in placements that would just be you know crazy uh, but given that we know what we're comparing it to a year ago uh, you know we're, it's just going to require that context not only in cattle and feed but pretty much in all of the cattle and beef and in general meat reports that come out over the next few months and that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Looks like a cold spring causing grains to rise. Let's not forget cotton's coming along for the ride too. But with this higher grains, livestock having to adapt and based on what the experts are saying, there may be more bullishness to come. Mike? Thanks, Zach. If you live in the big city and you're not a farmer, but you think you'd like to be someday, you'll get a kick out of this story. A creative New Yorker got the idea to start a nonprofit that teaches how to raise high margin veggies in those containers you see on ships. Believe it or not, it's working. Here's Peter Tubbs. So there's no doubt, and I hope that during the course of the year here, we will definitely inspire a number of these people to embark on a lifelong journey to be farmers. The here is the Bedford Stuyvesant neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York. On the edge of the parking lot of a former Pfizer pharmaceutical plant sit 10 shipping containers. Each has been converted for growing hydroponic vegetables under LED lighting. 10 laboratories for aspiring agricultural entrepreneurs growing food that is unique in product and location. The brainchild of Tobias Peggs, Square Roots is a nonprofit that aims to bring fresh produce to urban consumers by training farmers to build businesses in their communities. Each container has the production capacity of two acres of land and promises a better quality product by maintaining a consistent environment. And obviously people are increasingly moving to the city, right? So we've got to figure out how to farm um, in those urban areas, whether that's indoors in containers or whether that's outdoors, um, you know, in, in more sort of urban gardens or greenhouses, you know, whatever it is, the more food that's being grown close to the city, the more access that people have got to local food, the better. Square Roots mentors spend a year teaching the how-to of business and hydroponic agriculture to classes of recruits who dream of becoming urban farmers. Few of the entrepreneurs arrive with an agricultural background, so the learning curve can be steep. Farmer Josh Alaber spent his year learning to grow basil and build an audience for his crops. I spent the first two to three months walking around from restaurant to restaurant in Manhattan meeting chefs learning about what they value, learning about how I can improve my crops, and becoming a better farmer. 
So the, the startup time was really hard, but it worked because the product that we grow is so fresh and you say, I harvested this today. They taste it and they say, I've never tasted basil like this. Freshness is only one of the selling points for the Square Roots farmer. Growing crops unavailable in the wholesale and retail supply chain can help close a sale. A lot of these chefs have been in the culinary industry 30 to 40 years. And as a brand new farmer, because I'm growing in a really unique environment where I can grow really unique crops, I can bring them things that they've never tried before. And the taste is, speaks for itself um, because it's growing in the exact environment that it wants. The taste drives a solid price for produce. While a salad mix starts at $10 per pound, rare varieties of basil command $30 per pound at local restaurants. Each farmer develops a customer mix of restaurants and food retailers who buy in bulk and individuals who purchase salad greens through a subscription model. The greens are hand-picked and delivered up to three times a week. So we feel that the, the, the way the product is priced today is definitely mass market, but every single day we work to um, you know, improve the technology, make the system more efficient, that will allow us ultimately to bring down that price and ultimately uh, fulfill the mission that the company has, which is to bring real food to everyone. The physical constraints of a square roots container farm limit the types of crops grown by each farmer to just the small and valuable. Salad greens, kales, sorrel, Swiss chard, and herbs are best suited to the vertical towers inside the farms. Crops grow quickly under the red and blue LED lighting optimized for plant growth. A footprint of only 400 square feet allows a farm to squeeze into tight urban environments and shorten the literal distance from farm to plate. Under LED lighting, some crops go from seed to harvest in as little as eight weeks. The container farm has operating costs of roughly $1,000 per month, but requires only eight gallons of water per day. Once a crop rotation is developed, harvesting can happen each week, year round. So what we're able to do is create unique environments for crops in very urban settings. Um, Particularly today, we're in bed -Stuy. I personally grow crops that you wouldn't typically be able to find in a local environment. The ability to simulate varied environments is another advantage of growing crops inside a container. If a variety of basil prefers a specific temperature, humidity, or altitude, the environmental controls within a square roots farm can be set to mimic ideal growing conditions. While the ability to grow a high volume of quality produce in a small amount of urban space has been confirmed, price is the next frontier. For urban container farming to scale up and become affordable for a neighborhood, the cost per pound will have to decline. The fact that we're able to compete now tells us that as we really increase production and bring the cost down, we're going to be able to produce food at a much, much more competitive cost that's better quality than is already existing in the marketplace. Until then, the farm incubator will continue to experiment with a food supply chain that can be measured in yards rather than miles. At the end of the day, I think what the consumer wants is food that they can trust and that tastes really amazing. And if you know your farmer, you trust the food. Once you taste that food, you're won over. Great story. If you'd like to know more, visit squarerootsgrow.com. Well, next time on Farm Week, a tactic with roots in the fight against the pandemic. It's voluntary now, but seems to be gaining popularity, an electronic ID tag system for farm animals. It's not a new idea, but livestock buyers could be in the driver's seat, motivating sellers to have more information about their animals than ever before. These days, it gives new meaning to the idea of a hot brand. That's next time on Farm Week. Before we say goodbye to you at least, sadly, we say goodbye to one of our own, Carrie Lewis, who is moving on to other pastures. She's leaving the Office of Agricultural Communication at Mississippi State, where we produce our Farm Week show. Carrie is our media relations manager, an unsung hero. We are sorry to see her go. You may remember meeting Carrie last August. She was part of a production team working on Voices from the Flood. 
our series on that disaster in Mississippi's South Delta in 2019. Carrie interviewed all 19 flood victims for that series, and she couldn't have been a more compassionate interviewer, helping to create a sympathetic setting for those victims to describe what happened. Here's a clip of an interview with Carrie about those interviews shot late last year. One of the common threads that came through so many of the interviews was the sense of community that people felt that in some instances they knew they had good neighbors but they didn't know how many and how good they were until they really needed help and they were just stunned by the outpouring of help, physical labor, um, people encouraging them, checking on them to see how they were doing. They said that they loved where they lived and they loved their community. And that makes you feel good that after a tragedy like this, people weren't pointing fingers really at anyone else in their community. They were just all lifting each other up and that was a beautiful experience. A sweet spirit. Carrie will remain at MSU, moving to another division where water research is being done. She's been working in our office for 10 years. She'll be missed. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.